All right, so today we're going to talk about the, the idea of, of emotion. But before we jump into emotion, I just want to mention this one thing. I, I know most of us watching this have been exposed to this material in one form or another. Tom, Tom might be the exception. He's just really coming in cold and, and trying to embrace some stuff. Most of her, the goal here is not to just teach it again, but to really try to help you guys feel like you could teach it that you understand the kind of the underbelly of why we're trying to emphasize these things, or at least why I'm trying to. You may land in a place where you want to emphasize something else. I'm okay with that. I just at least want you to say, hey, this has been helpful to me, or I could see how it could be helpful in our context. I want to start handling this truth. I want to give you as many tools and understandings and resources and explanations as you can to go do it. And I would encourage you to think about what, what it is that you what are you going to do with this? Are you going to, you know, how are you going to start handling this truth? Maybe it's with a couple. Maybe it's in a small group context. Um, maybe it is to start a little class in some way, or um, e even to write or practice doing it. You know, share some of the ideas in little segments in your Sunday teaching, wherever it might be, that you can begin to start feeling confident to handle this, handle these things accurately, and feel confident. In them. That's where we're really going. So we're going to talk about the role of emotion. One thing I want to mention. Um, related to this, the, the way you handle this, is, the way you teach this is, is going to be in large part determined by who you're talking to. When you are talking to a older than 30, you know, 30 to 60 year old Western evangelical audience, there's, there's, a, there's some assumptions you can probably make about their understanding or their emphasis on emotion and how you deal with it because it, we, we share a common culture. But if you're teaching this in, in another culture where, where emotion is, is a primary means of, of, of decision making and, and in, in a non-Western world, you may have to approach this differently. We were walking through some of the ideas of, of understanding emotion in our hearts with some folks that their, their disciples were, were coming out of, of um, a number of, of cultures, but it was centered in Europe. And in Europe, it's far more common to, to, to be, to validate things with your emotion. Maybe maybe that's a function of being young. I'm not sure what, why that's true, but I didn't have to talk anyone into paying attention to their emotions. In fact, probably the right message was to, to be careful <laughs> about your emotion, but here's how you rightly understand it. So it may change a little bit based on who you're talking to. That's the big idea there. For most of, of, of the people that are going to watch this that in, in, in the next few weeks or months, it's, it's going to be in mostly a Western context. So to just know that you, we do not have typically permission to validate or, or to pay attention to our emotion. Um, the, the, there's a bias against it in the church. In culture, there's not, but in the church, there would be a bias against it. Okay, so how many of you have ever seen this? This is a, Bill Bright used to always teach the, the 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 idea that what really matters is not what you feel, but the facts, and then you bring faith to it. That's the energy that drives the the engine, and then your feelings will will track along. And so, if you just keep choosing to you know meditate and understand on on what's true. Uh, exercise faith in it, and then then your feelings will eventually come around. And and I'm not I'm not going to disagree that that's a, a reasonably good way to make decisions. We don't want to be people who make decisions based on on what we're feeling and, and ignore facts or or what God has asked us to do in faith. But it, it's a little more complicated than that because if we if we become people that simply say this is what's true, this is what I should do. So I'm going to keep pressing on that and never actually understand what's going on in, the, in our inner world or what, why we're feeling what we're feeling. We will probably neglect our opportunity to become more relational and to become more, more healthy in our soul. And so the, 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 this, this picture that just ignore it, the feelings will come around, that's a temporary thing. Eventually your emotion, I don't know if you caught that little, that, that little um, mention that Nathan gave to that it releases, um, I, I don't know if you said toxins or, or, or stress into our body. Um, inflammation. Inflammation. Eventually, your body 
will bear the result of not dealing with emotion in a healthy way. Okay, you, you, you're, it's going to be spoken of, it's going to be dealt with in one way or another. Usually, if we don't have healthy ways, it moves towards very unhealthy ways that we're, we're dealing with emotion. So the goal of, of being able to connect and, and why emotion is important is because it, it's, it's a function of what we feel, what we're feeling is significant to how we're experiencing our own beliefs and in inner world and also how we're experiencing relationship and connection to God and others. Okay, so it's a great picture when you're making a decision. It's an awful picture if you're trying to understand what's going on inside of you or grow in your understanding of, of what other people might be experiencing. And so in, in Western Christianity, this is the way I was trained, that it, everybody knows what to do if you have an emotion and, and you're, you're you, you driving down, the, and this would be the picture of it, you're driving down the road and the, and the little warning light comes on in your car. And, and this is functionally what I was taught, that, well, when that comes on, you ignore it. And the best way to do that is to reach in your console, pull out a little black roll of electrical tape, just tear a piece off and just put it over whatever lights on there. And then it's gone. You just keep driving. Everything's fine. Just ignore it. And then pretty soon another light comes on. You just keep doing that. And, and that's often how we can function. And, and so the, the, the this picture of ignore it will go away. Well, would that work if you were driving your car? And th this is why this is really important because people have been told this, they believe this, you have to be, when you're teaching it, you have to be a little bit ridiculous to say, that's dumb. You can't ignore something. Why is it there? Did God put emotion in you? Did he? Is he, does, does he experience emotion? You begin to drive home these points. Well, it's there for a reason. If you don't understand God, God's design and intention for emotion, you may miss what it's supposed to be helping you accomplish. And when you think about it and you use this metaphor of this picture of, 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 of warning lights on a dashboard, it's telling you there's something going on. Usually in this context, something is wrong. Something is wrong with the car. And, and, and what it's saying is you should pay attention to this. And so if we can map over and, and understand that God gave us emotion to help us, to help us. And we're going to come back a little bit to, to what's going on in that emotion, but it's telling us something that feels true. Emotion does not lie to us. They're not stupid. They're very accurate and they're very honest. They tell you exactly what's going on inside your soul. Okay. Now what's going on in your soul might be really broken and toxic and lie based and, you know, straight out of the pit of hell, but all your heart is doing is saying, this is going on down there. So the wise person feels that unpleasant emotion, doesn't ignore it, but pulls it out in the light and go, what in the world is going on down there? Whether it's anger or anxiety or, or other, some other fear, some other fear family, whatever it might be, what is going on down there and bring it into the light. And that's the healthy way to understand what emotion is doing. Now, when we, when we think about this, this idea of emotion, most of the time when we say emotion is bad, we're thinking about emotionalism. That's where our, we are governed by, we make all our decisions based on, emotion is, is what justifies any behaviors. We're feeling upset and we're throwing things around and go, oh, I'm just upset. You'll just have to bear with me. Well, no, that's ungodly and that's, just, that's not true. That's not what, what a child of God is called to do or live like. But the, the idea that if I don't pay any attention to my emotion is, is what actually will lead me to help is, is pretty naive because eventually emotion is going to manifest itself. And if that emotion is rooted in deep beliefs that you hold or deep sense of loss or disconnection, if your body is riddled with, with the uh, um, cortisol and you're feeling all this anxiety and you just keep trying to do the right thing, Eventually, you just fritz out and go, man, I can't do it anymore. I can't fake it anymore. I can't fake it. God wants us to be healthy. And that means we have to somehow find a way to deal with that. So here, here would be my observation. This is something I always mention when I'm teaching this. I think the, the most emotional, emotionalistic people, there's, there's two kinds. One that they just bought into the culture's idea. You can just be, feel, say, do anything, and that's okay. Well, we all as followers of Jesus. Wait, no, that's not okay. 
I would just say that those who have the least emotional awareness or acumen or, or vocabulary or understanding are going to end up being the people who are most shaped by their negative emotions. And whether that's being shut down, whether that's being kind of just angry or curse or, or, or uh, fearful or shame riddled, whatever it is, if you don't have a means and a vocabulary and tools and relationship that helps you bring that, that toxic feeling emotion out into the light and deal with it in God ordained way, it's probably going to lead you to behaviors or actions or attitudes or thoughts that are completely ungodly that you will regret. And so our, our goal in this to know ourselves is to increase our emotional awareness. Not to stuff that so that but that God can do something with that. And that sometimes that's relationship based. Sometimes that's addressing it with truth, whatever it might be. But we don't just ignore it. OK, so we all have an emotional capacity. And if we don't have means for dealing with with our hurt and sadness and anger and fear and guilt and condemnation, we, there is no room for positive emotions. It, it, it doesn't it just. There's, there's no place for it to go. And any, if we're all filled with those negative things, any little jostling, any, any anybody tries to put else anything else in there, then some of those negative um, outcomes are going to start flowing out of there from depression to addiction behavior to um, sharpness or disconnection from relationship. We only have so much emotional capacity. And if we don't have a means to find and experience care from God and one another, um, we're, we're, it's going to fill up with the, with the junk. We have to exhale. We have to get rid of the carbon dioxide to bring in more uh, oxygen. By the way, this, this is a, a, a thing that I'll often share um, when, when I'm, I'm doing this. The, do you know what kills you when you stop breathing? Do you know what the actual process is? Maybe you guys all know this. I didn't know this till about eight or nine years ago. It's the buildup of carbon dioxide. It's not the absence of oxygen. That's what actually kills you. You can go a lot longer without oxygen than you can go without getting rid of the carbon dioxide in your body. Somehow it has this, this um, deadly effect on us. And so that's the way some of those negative emotions are. We have to have processes to figure that out. Um, as we think about putting the, the emotion together with relational need, there's, I'm going to go through this super fast. You'll, you'll obviously have access to this to take notes or do whatever. And this is in the slide uh, presentation that you'll all be shared with. So we start with this relational need. We and, and, and this first one is somehow we have a sense, an emotion that we are not experiencing healthy life. And so we experience aloneness. And then that leads us to think faulty things. We all, we're always going to draw conclusions and, 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 um, we're going to assign meaning to whatever's going on in our life. It's just a function of being human. And so that leads to faulty thinking when we are not in a healthy place. We're not in a, in a relationally healthy place. That leads to even more negative feelings and then eventually to unhealthy behaviors. When we choose those unhealthy behaviors, eventually there's going to be those painful outcomes of whether that, that would be addiction or isolation or whatever it might be. If we don't have a healthy way to deal with that unpleasant emotion, Relationally, there's a good chance we're going to we're going to walk that out in a way that's not very healthy. So the, the opportunity we have when we're paying attention to our emotion is I'm saying, OK, I'm, I'm feeling something. I seek connection. I seek to 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 move into relationship with God and others. That leads me to healthy thinking, healthy experiences, positive feelings and healthy behaviors and positive outcomes. And so so where does this all start? Well, it starts with our our sense of this unpleasant emotion being experienced. And then we have this, we have this, this, this watershed place. What direction are we going to go? Are we going to move towards just walking in our aloneness or are we going to pursue connection with God and others? And so there's a, it's a, it's a, that's kind of a big deal. We're going to come back and, and spend another little section on this, but this is kind of the primary three ways that we, we deal with um, our aloneness. This is, this is how we cope with unpleasant emotions. And there's kind of three families of things we'll try to walk in, typically walk in. There's others, but these, this is, you're going to need to be familiar with these as you're helping people understand and, and sort out their, their, their patterns of thinking, their patterns of responding. We have this anger, pride, um, kind of family of responses. We have this fear where it's all about control and selfishness. Self-reliance is, is anger, pride, self, selfishness. We tend to build a world in fear. 
and then shame is that self-condemnation. We're going to circle back and spend at least 15 minutes on that on another session. Um, but but I want to at least introduce it as a concept because this this relates to if we don't deal with if we don't deal intelligently with what we're doing what, what our uh, unpleasant emotions are. There's a good chance we're going to have one of these as a favorite. Maybe maybe all three in equal measure, but typically people would have a, a, a kind of a, a a common way they would deal with those unpleasant emotions. For me personally, that's anger and pride. That, that'd be my, my go-to thing is I just, I declare myself self-reliant and, and move away from connection and then have all kinds of unhealthy outcomes that flows downstream from that. That's that all we'll say about that for now. Here's, here's where all, again, this, this emotional awareness comes in. The idea of, of learning to manage our heart. Um, there's a verse in Proverbs that I think is, is really, really key. Uh, this, this flowed out of a, a, a lot of study and understanding the book of Proverbs that maybe is not as, as common. And, and I, 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 I'm fairly confident that, that I'm, I'm seeing it in, in, a, in an appropriate way. I would call this verse, based on what I understand about the book of Proverbs, I would call it the linchpin of the entire book of Proverbs. And it is one of those 10 or 12 verses in the Bible that has this imperative that says, kind of this idea of first of all, or, you know, this is like a matter of first importance. There aren't that many of those verses in the scripture. And, 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 and clearly, because they don't all deal with the same subject, there's more, there's, there's not just one first of all. But, but here's how I, I look at those kind of verses. I want to make sure, well, if I'm going to miss something, if I'm going to misinterpret something or misapply something, I don't want to misapply those. You know, the, the scriptures have kind of given me a heads up. Hey, everybody, this is really important. Pay attention to this little truth I'm getting ready to say. Well, I sweep those all into a pile and go, okay, I want to make sure I'm paying attention to these. And this is one of those. And I believe why I think this is the linchpin of the book of Proverbs is because I... I I believe that the, the book of Proverbs is at its core an appeal to, to choose that which is good and honorable, to choose to care about that which is you know, agrees with the things of God. And if that's true, it'll lead you towards wisdom. And if you want to be wise, then it, there, here's lots of practical ways to know you're being wise. So there's a very practical element to the book of Proverbs. But I would say fundamentally, it's, it's a book about managing your heart about choosing well what's going to be in your innermost being okay so here, here's just a little slide that's helpful to me and, and as i teach this this if, if you talk to most if you would you, you would poll most western classrooms of christians evangelical christians what and you say what's what's more significant in the scripture what what the bible has to say about the heart or what the Bible has to say about the mind, what the Bible has to say about truth, and and just the way we're conditioned. Well, it's, it's all about the truth, and it is. Please don't. I'm not. I'm not turning that card over. But here's what the truth is: if you if you did a, a word study and you count them all up, the word heart is used, depending on the English translation, somewhere north of 850 times, Old and New Testament. The, the idea of mind or that, you know, what's what's what we think kind of mind thoughts somewhere between 150 and 200 times, again, depending on the translation. And there, occasionally when it speaks of the heart, it's only talking about this purely emotional and, and its warnings about being deceitful and some of those things, but not very many of those. And the mind occasionally is talking about being purely cognitive, but it's also broken and <laughs> deceitful and, 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 and sinful. It's, it's, it's all depraved, okay? But there's this place called the innermost being, mostly in the New Testament or the inner man. That's also called the soul. But most of the time when the Bible uses the word heart, it's talking about that place, our soul. Most of the time, even in that 150 to 200 times it says the word mind, it's talking about an element of that same place. This place of deep conviction, of belief, not just information. Okay, So this is an important piece. To, if, if we're going to elevate this idea of the heart being and relationship being really central to God's plan and to do relationship well, we have to live from our heart. Well, then we have to start understanding our heart. We have to start knowing what that actually means. And it's not just about information. It's and and so when it's talking about the heart, most of these eight hundred times, 
it's talking about this place, the soul, this part that makes us in the image of God, that where, where we keep our deepest beliefs, our convictions, the core person that we are, our eternal being is found in this place, our values, our motivations, our passions, what we care about. And it keeps some of the deceitfulness and deception and lies that we believe if they're deeply held. It's all in this innermost being place. And so, so having a mechanism for guarding that, paying attention to it so it doesn't lead us astray is pretty significant. This is a tool I use. I don't know if anybody else when they teach this will ever do this, but I'll, I'll, sh I'll just share it the way I share it. Um, several years ago, as I was trying to put all this down, I, I, I looked up the amplified version of Proverbs 4.23, looking for this really killer um, explanation of this verse. And, and I looked it up and it was exactly like all the others and just really, really simple. So I was disappointed. I went and looked at about 50 different translations. Most of them are very similar. There's a few, there's a few variations, but I, I just wove it together to create my, my own amplified version so I could hear how all the translators, it, it kind of built a case for why this was so significant. And, and, and it starts with this, above all, with all vigilance and all diligence above every charge, guard, watch, and keep your heart. And, and this is the, the word here is this soul, this innermost being place where we keep all those convictions, manage this, manage what you love. And this is why. For it determines the course of your life. From it flows the springs and wellspring of your life, the issues and outgoings of life, everything you do. And so that's what the book of Proverbs says, is you have to pay attention to what you care about, because what you care about is going to determine the whole course of your life what you're ruled by, what you're passionate about, what your treasure is, all those warnings that Jesus gives about the, the kingdom of the heart, which is, it, it's, it's an idea. It's not necessarily a, a, a strong biblical theology, but you can kind of get this picture. He says, I'm worried about what's on inside of you. That's, that's, that's what we're trying to transform here. What's, what's on the inside? I don't care about the outside of the cup. I want to know what's in you. And so, Paying attention to what's going on in our heart is very, very significant to all how we experience relationship with God and with others, what, what our motivations are. All those things are ruled by that. Here, here was the, at the end of the day, every translation had this one idea and was crystal clear. Your heart equals your life. Whatever's going on in that inner world where, where that's going to produce it. Now, why is that significant when we're talking about emotions? Because our emotions are the voice of that world. Our emotions are communicating very accurately exactly what is going on in that part of our existence, part of our being. Now, what's going on in there, again, may be toxic and lie-based and really broken and deceitful. But the emotion isn't what's making it deceitful. It's what's present in you that yet needs, needs to be convinced or persuaded to, to the, the rule and reign of Christ in a different way or a different understanding. And so if we ignore the emotion, we never pull into the light those parts that are actually hurtful to us or defensive or some of those coping mechanisms that we're going to get back to later. If we don't know what's going on in this inner part of us and, 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 and listen to the emotion to, to let it tell us, hey, there's something going on in here, we never bring those coping mechanisms into the light and then we keep these walls up. And we don't experience relationships. So it's it's a very, very significant part. The emotion is a very significant part of saying, okay, I'm I'm experiencing aloneness. I want to move towards something healthy. I'm experiencing a negative emotion. Ooh, what is going on inside of me? And it's it's a very useful tool that God has given us to know that inner man so that we can guard it, so that the outcome of our life is what we would choose in faith. Uh, according to the gospel and not just the crud that we carry around from from our lives.